since this is the imagination seminar, um, we thought we'd start with a really interesting <laughs> picture here, which uh, Chris and I were talking about it this morning, reminded us of uh, the Jodie Foster movie um, called Contact. It's one of my favorite, favorite movies. So if you've ever seen it, uh, this uh, might remind you a little bit about that. Um, again, very delighted to be here with all of you. I'm going to pass it over to my good friend and colleague, Chris Dulce. All right. Thank you, Jorge. And yeah, just to echo Jorge's uh, sentiments, I'm very excited and, and um, looking forward to, to being with you all today. Um, so we're going to start off with uh, just a quick little warm-up poll activity. Um, so we'll have a, di a few different things. If you can go, go to use your phone to go to pollev.com slash Jorge. Uh, we have about four or five questions that we'll start off with just to just to kind of get everyone ready. All right, so we're going to start off with how are you feeling today? So go ahead and mark one of those faces. I believe that you can just touch the face and it'll register your vote. Oh, two green. We go. two right, we've got a couple so far. So I'm happy. I, I wish we had a tired one on there. <laughs> None of those are obviously tired, so. <laughs> um, good, okay, mostly good. Well, neutral, that's all right. Um, yeah, I'll just give it another couple seconds to let everyone make sure everyone's able to get on and it's working. Um, and let us know if at any point you're having issues, you can just go ahead and uh, type it into the chat box and we can try to work things out. Um, good, okay, we can work, move on then to the next question. Um, all right, so there's another one. Imagination is more important than knowledge. So this is a, an Albert Einstein quote, imagination is more important than knowledge. Type A if you agree, B if you disagree. And Chris, just to jump in, you could also, in this particular question and in some others, you can use text messaging. You can text the, my name, my first name, Jorge, to the number 22333, and you only have to do it once for all other polls that we do throughout the session. So, oh, wow. Okay. okay. So we've got mostly agree. Some disagree, and we were actually talking about this um, as we were preparing for it. And it's kind of, you know, you need both, obviously, because um, you, you need that knowledge, that foundation to actually do what you need to do. But the imagination is, of course, really, really important, especially when it comes to innovation and invention and uh, problem solving, coming up with new ideas that haven't been done before. You need that, that imagination portion of it. Um, okay. Go ahead and move on to the third one. Um, can anyone be an inventor? Yes, not really, or maybe. So far, yes, maybe. <laughs> yeah, so a big, a big portion of, of what we do is trying to really get the word out there that that invention isn't limited to anyone really in particular. Um, and that's why we go around the country um, talking to all types of groups, all types of all age groups, um, really emphasizing that invention can be for anybody as long as you've got the uh, the mindset and the, the resources available to you. Um, and those can be really whatever whatever works for you, um, but yeah, we we are we are firmly of the belief that that anyone in this country can be an inventor. Um, it's just a matter of getting that message out to, to kids and and finding ways to inspire them. Okay, so what are some skills that you think your students need to become inventors or entrepreneurs? This one's more of a um, a bubble quiz. So you're going to see words popping up on the screen. Uh, the more that those, if those words are entered once or twice, uh, the more they're entered, the bigger they're going to actually get. 
So for example, a couple of people have put creativity. So creativity is the biggest word on the screen at the moment. Um, but good, so we've got, it looks like critical thinking. Um, let's see, imagination, failing. Um, good, there's some really good ones. Out of the box thinking, yeah. Um, desire, that's another good one. Opportunity, um, yeah. Determination is another good one. Um, that kind of grit or that, that ability to, to push through things. Um, so creativity still got the still got the lead, but it's getting smaller. Um, this is great. There's a ton of answers out here. This is this is great. Um, yeah, perseverance, problem solving. Um, good. I mean, definitely that that flexibility of thinking, um, the ability to think outside the box. That again, the imagination, the power of the imagination to come up with solutions that that haven't been thought of yet. Um, so you all are doing really great with this. Thank you for your responses. Um, I think we can probably move on to the last quiz or the last question on the quiz, um, which is going to be. Uh, going to be. <laughs> yeah. I have to find my mouse. Okay. Yeah, and we're. Okay, so here we go. The last one. Um, what do you hope to learn in the next hour? So this is we're trying to get a little bit of feedback from you all, uh, just to get a feel for what you're what you're hoping to learn, um, and and get out of this, especially as a kind of an introduction to who we are and what we do. Uh, everything. <laughs> well, Dr. B and I will do our best to teach you everything. Um, I don't know if we'll get to everything, but um, that's why we, we start to build these relationships and we can, we can talk uh, more in depth the, the further along these relationships get. Um, okay, how, how to help kids apply for patents, something new, trademarks and patents, um, learning about the patent process. So yeah, we're gonna be going over, um, over all of that and especially patents um, during this presentation, but we're also going to focus on, on the other aspects of intellectual property. So trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets as well. Um, student engagement. Um, yeah, a lot of, and a lot of what we do is figuring out different ways, different strategies for getting, for making IP accessible to kids and getting them excited about uh, not only invention, but what are the next steps? So when, when I do create something new, um, what should I be thinking about next? Uh, how does one get a patent? Good. Okay, so this is a great start. Um, I'm excited to see this, uh, this level of engagement and passion from all of you. Uh, and I hope that we, can, that we can do what you're hoping and, and uh, really fulfill your, uh, your wishes with, with this presentation. So from there, I will turn it over to Dr. B. Go thank ahead. You, thank you, Chris, and thank you, audience, uh, everyone for contributing. Um, I think we're spot on uh, in regards to what you just uh, said and what the objectives that we wanna be through today. Um, they're really four, um, as Chris mentioned uh, at the US Patent and Trademark Office, we are interested in, in, in increasing um, intellectual property literacy and using IP as a sort of a, uh, as a tool for student learning and supporting educators um, like the ones that are here today with strategies um, and resources to help you do that. And as, uh, as part of that process to elevate um, student engagement in STEM, we just saw a really nice uh, video, career tech video before this uh, session started about the importance of STEM and how that STEM is really everywhere and impacts uh, all kinds of career pathways for children in the future. So, uh, this is a disclaimer that we have to put um, in every presentation. As the U.S. government, we do not, uh, federal government agency, we do not endorse any products. If you see any references to commercial products or things, um, we're saying we don't endorse that. So that's just a legal disclaimer. Um, as Chris mentioned in Delbo, um, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office is America's innovation agency. We're an agency of the Department of Commerce. Um, 
And we're responsible for three things, issuing patents, registering trademarks, and also advising the administration on intellectual property policy issues, which includes, and we're gonna talk a little bit about this during the next hour, patents, trademarks, and also copyrights. And also there's a fourth one as well. We have, our headquarters is based outside of Washington, DC, and it's in Alexandria, Virginia. And if you're ever in that area, please come uh, stop by and visit with us. Um, we also have four regional offices across the nation so that we can be closer to the inventor. We have one in Detroit. That was our, uh, our second office, I think, our first office, second. Denver, Silicon Valley, and Dallas. And we are super, super excited that um, Wayne Stacy, our newest leader in charge of the USPTO Silicon Valley Regional Office that's located in San Jose, California, is with us this morning. So Wayne, I don't know if you can hear me. I hope you're on. <clears throat> Do you want to say a few words to this amazing group of educators who are uh, eager to learn more about the work that we do at the USPTO. Wayne, can you hear me? I can. All right. There we go. Uh, so thank you for introducing me. Uh, so I, I have to start in, when I get back to, to my, my home region. Uh, People think, well, I'm in Silicon Valley, so I'm a Californian. Um, no, I, I happen to live in California. I went to high school, born and raised in Stratford, Texas, up in the Panhandle, uh, just south of, of Guymon, Oklahoma. Um, my family has, has deep roots in Oklahoma. My family mostly is from the Durant area. Uh, my grandfather, uh, his birth certificate actually shows uh, Indian territory on the, the Choctaw Reservation. So deep ties hey, to that area. And, and, and the reason say, I think that I think that's Durant, right? Durant. <laughs> well, my family has obviously. So, so the, the whole story of, about that is uh, they tell my, my grandfather left during the Depression trying to make it to California and ran out of money in Lubbock. And that's where he had to stay. So um, my, my general joke is that's the only reason people would stay in Lubbock is if they ran out of money. Um, <laughs> But um, so my background, you know, isn't in technology. My, my grandparents didn't finish eighth grade. My parents didn't go to college. So I didn't have a natural inclination to technology or the technology field. And I ended up with an engineering degree uh, out of SMU and a law degree uh, from the East Coast. And all of that comes down to, I can point to two teachers that changed my entire perspective. And what they did was they took the classroom work and connected it to careers and how to make a living. And, uh, you know, I, I cannot thank those two teachers enough. I've, I've lost both of them uh, in the last few years, but they set me on a path that I would have never, I would have never left Stratford, uh, but for what they did. And I think that's, that says a lot for the importance of not only STEM education in the classroom, but the broader view of what you can do with STEM if you get it. Because originally math was a class to me, but then it became a career path. And I would have never found it without teachers. And I love the, the videos I saw for what you do and how you're connecting the academic side with the real world side. And so why does that all matter to the United States Patent Office? Well, I've had the, the privilege but in my prior job of trying cases around the country to juries everywhere. And I tell them all the same thing. Companies do not invent anything. Companies aren't the great innovators of the United States. Individuals are, people are. It's the individual person that then contributes to those companies. And you can see that on the face of any United States patent, right up front, the first two things that are listed, it says United States patent, and right under that is the name of the individual inventor. It's the person. And the key to getting any person to be an inventor is gotta be what you do as educators in getting people involved. So you're really the, the foundation of the entire innovation economy. Now those patents go on to you know, be collateral to fund businesses and to help grow businesses and create jobs. But it all starts with the individual inventor. 
So what you do is critical to the economy as a whole. So at the risk of you know, giving a bunch of educators a homework assignment, uh, there's a podcast that I think you would all really enjoy. Uh, it's, the series is called American Innovations and the episodes on electronic television. Now, I won't tell you the whole story, but the players are the inventor of te television. His name is Philo Farnsworth, a high school science teacher, and the United States Patent and Trademark Office. And the end of this story is the fact that if you go to the Hall of Statutes in Washington, D.C., Utah has put him right alongside Brigham Young as their two most important people for Utah. He sits along in the same statute collection as Will Rogers. And it's all really linked to him as an individual and to the science teacher that backed him and his ability to defend his inventions with the patent office. So it'll, it's a great story. It's a great thing to share because uh, it shows how teachers make a real difference. Uh, with that, I'll give it back to you, Dr. V. Hey, Wayne, thank you so much. We really appreciate those remarks and your passion. Uh, we sure are very lucky, very fortunate to have you on the leadership team at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. And we look forward to working with you and your team across the region to bring IP innovation uh, across the region and into classrooms and and inspire kids. Uh, so thank you so much again for being able to join us. And thank you for the preview on Philo because it's, stay tuned, it might be coming up. <laughs> All right, um, Chris, let's get started uh, with a few examples of inventions. Uh, Wayne mentioned uh, the importance of inventions and that people do inventions, that people innovate. So the first one on the upper left is uh, an invention back in 1934, Wiley Post and R.S. Colley invented the pressurized flight suit that would make high altitude flights possible. Um, he was concerned about getting um, sick on a flight, so he designed a three-layer suit that would help with altitude sickness and pave the way for um, other designs. Uh, that was my first love. I thought I was gonna be an astronaut, ended up being a scientist, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> um, Chris, you wanna take the next one? Sure, the next one, that, that ball you see on top of the tower, um, this is NEXRAD, which stands for Next Generation Radar. Um, basically, it was, it was built in uh, 1990, I believe, is the first prototype, um, and it's designed to provide better weather forecasting. Um, the one next to that on the right, you can see it's a supermarket chain. Notice that his customers couldn't fit all their goods in, in handheld baskets. So in 1937, he designed the first shopping cart, right? We take that for granted, on wheels and received a U.S. patent in 1940, which actually paid him royalties for 17 years. And then the, that fourth, that bottom left picture um, is a picture of a phone, but uh, the invention that we're talking about is uh, actually voicemail. Uh, so that was invented in the 1970s uh, as a way for people to record messages uh, for, for people when they're not home. And if you look at Chris, Christopher's background, he's a big music fan and he's got a picture of a guitar. I think that's an acoustic guitar, right? It is, yeah. Uh, but in 1935, an inventor was the first to electrify his guitar. He was then uh, for, uh, later elected into the steel, I didn't even know this existed, the Steel Guitar Hall of Fame. So why are we showing you these things? Do you guys know what all these inventions have in common? Type your answers in the chat box now, please, that you find your chat box and, um, and, type, and type what you think these inventions have in common. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> That's right. These were all inventions that came from uh, Oklahomans. So good job, guys. You guys are uh, really busy at inventing. And we hope that uh, the children from Oklahoma will continue uh, in that legacy. Awesome. Go Oklahoma. Oklahoma is okay, right? And we see that we we did see the parking meter. We didn't include that one because we had to limit it to five, but uh, but we did notice the parking meter was one of them. 
Okay. Um, going back, uh, kind of resonating with some of the comments that Wayne Stacy made, you know, as America's Innovation Agency, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office is really committed to two things, uh, fostering innovation and growth by creating um, a reliable, a predictable, and a high quality intellectual property system. And we'll discuss in more detail um, later, what is intellectual property? Um, much of, if you think about it, much of human progress depends on innovation, right? It depends on people coming up with breakthrough ideas to improve our lives. Uh, think about penicillin or cancer treatments, electricity, or even one that's kind of near and dear to my heart, which is the silicon chip. Um, for this reason, societies have a big interest in making sure that as many people as possible have the opportunity to become scientists, inventors, and entrepreneurs. It's really not only a matter of fairness, it's, um, you know, it's, it's more than that. Denying opportunities to talented young people can end up hurting everyone. Uh, and there was a study conducted by a research team at Stanford, MIT, Harvard, and the London School of Economics that concluded that we as a nation could quadruple 4X the rate of innovation in the United States by increasing invention rates among women, minorities, and those from lower income families. Right? And all of you here today in this audience are here as educators that serve as educators in communities across Oklahoma. You guys are our frontline workers because you inspire, because you teach, because you prepare our children for the workforce of the future. And we're here to tell you that the US Patent and Trademark Office is here to support you in that very important mission that we both share. <clears throat> uh, the study I just referenced uh, is also referred to as the Lost Einsteins. And it concluded one thing, very important conclusion, that exposure to innovation increases substantially the chances that children will become future inventors. So children who grow up in, more, in areas with more inventors and thereby are more exposed to innovation while growing up are much more likely to then become the inventors themselves. For example, if you grow up uh, where Wayne is now in San Jose, California, you're about five times more likely to become an inventor, <clears throat> let's say, than a child who grows up in Arkansas or maybe even certain parts of Oklahoma. And that's why it's so important that we have partnerships like the Oklahoma you know, Education and Industry Partnership, the OEIP, I'll get the acronym correct, I can <laughs> to really change the equation around. So we're counting on you guys. Last year, the USPTO released a white paper entitled Progress and Potential. It's available on our website. Um, it's a profile of women inventors on US patents. And it showed that women still comprise a very small percentage, about 12% of patent inventors. So women, like other underrepresented groups, are among the world, you know, the law sciences. People, as Wayne mentioned, who may contribute valuable inventions had they been exposed to innovation and had greater access to our American patent system. So why does this matter? Well, let me tell you. Patents can, one, promote innovation and help safeguard your inventions. It can help communities or companies grow, benefit the communities by making available new goods and products and services, providing personal growth, development, and advancement. And all of this is good for your career tech students and students in STEM who are about to enter the workforce. Intellectual property intensive industries have been shown through data are critically important to our US economy. 45 million jobs, 38% of the gross domestic product and 45% higher wages. So what we wanna do next is begin to start the process of demystifying intellectual property for you. So hopefully you can take some of these concepts and principles apply them in the classroom, 
and help your kids and your students understand a little bit more about intellectual property. So I'm gonna give you a little assignment now. Let's um, begin by taking a look at this picture and um, using your chat box, uh, take a moment to uh, type the different types of intellectual property that you see in this picture. Copyrights. Okay, Courtney. Books, graphics, design, illustrations, inventions, trademarks, nice, music, brands, awesome, books and articles, registered trademarks. I wonder where you go to get those. <laughs> nice. Brain power. Yep, it starts with the brain for sure. All right. All right, you got some good, good, um, good feedback there. Ideas. Yeah, they start with an idea. Yeah, the USPTO. Nice job, Cindy. All right, so let me, let's see here. So there are basically four types of intellectual property, right? Patents, trademarks, copyrights. I, think, I don't think anybody wrote trade secrets. We're gonna talk a little bit about that uh, briefly. But what do they all have in common? As someone pointed out, brain power. They really come from creations of the mind, from your students, from real people who invent things, who write things, who draw things. And so patents, trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets are forms, are different forms uh, of protection that you can have for your hard work. Um, and a person can have, or a company may have one or more types of intellectual property. So IP rights allow us to protect and control not only our inventions and our names and our brands and our original writings and artwork, how they're used, but they also provide us guidelines for um, use of other people's intellectual property as well. All right, so um, some of you have been asking, well, what is a patent? Let's define a patent. Um, it's actually the right to exclude others from either making, using, selling, offering for sale, or even importing that claimed invention. It lasts for a limited amount of time, depending on the type of patent, we'll get to that in a moment, and it's territorial. So a US patent issued by the United States Patent and Trademark Office provides protection only in the United States of America. There are really no such thing as worldwide patent protection. Um, if you think your product might sell in Europe, you have to go to the European Union to get uh, a patent there, okay? All right. Patents protect what? Inventions, the light bulb, right, is a classic example. The iPad, iPhone has probably several thousand patents. It could be toys. Here's an example of uh, a toy that you may know about, the Lincoln Locks, uh, back from 1920, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so there are three types of patents, design, plant, and utility. Uh, when you think about design, they, they design patents protect the way something looks. It's like it's ornamental value. Uh, in 1930, Congress passes the, uh, the Plant Patent Act, which creates a distinctive type of patent to protect new varieties of asexually reproduced plants. And pictured here is actually plant patent number one for a new type of climbing rose, as some of you may know, because they're so popular today. It's called the New Dawn. The third one is the utility patent, and they are the most common. These patents are the most common and can fall into several categories. Um, it could be a new process or method, a new product, a new machine, or even a new composition of matter. For example, a new drug that you might have invented for a pharmaceutical company. There are three basic requirements for a utility patent. They have to be new, they have to be useful, have utility, and non-obvious. Well, what does non-obvious mean? Um, well, let's take an example here. So non-obvious means that you can put different inventions together to create something new and different. For example, before the electric car was invented, we had automobiles, we had electricity. Was putting those two things together obvious? Mm, 
Mm, probably not. All you got to do is just ask Elon Musk about that. He'll probably tell you that it's not obvious. Um, here's a story about a little boy from Northern California. And one day he left a cup with a sugary drink um, outside of his house. Uh, and it had a little stir in it because his mother was calling him to eat supper. Uh, and winters in Northern California can, can get cold. So the next morning he found the cup frozen. Um, like any kid would do, he pulled on the stir and voila, out came the first popsicle. It was called back then the Epsicle and then the name was registered as the popsicle. See the little R with the circle around it? Um, the registered trademark today belongs to Good Humor and Briars. Um, on the left, you see a drawing from, the ninth, from his 1924 U.S. patent entitled Frozen Confectionery. It's a utility patent for a process for making these kinds of frozen confectionery, uh, what we call today popsicles. Here's another example, uh, patent number 6 million. We're up to 10 million, more than 10 million in the United States. Um, and the idea, this is the Healy. The Healy, some of you may remember, they were popular a few years ago. Um, you may refer to patents to get ideas, to create new and improved inventions. Um, actually, patents can be a treasure trove for your students as they seek inspiration to come up with inventions of their own. Uh, this is the, the Healy shoe again. Uh, would never catch me on one of those. <laughs> All right. Um, Chris, I think we're ready for a knowledge tech to see if our audience has been paying attention. What do you think? I think it sounds good. All right, sure. take it away. All right, so we're going to we have a couple quick questions to see how you're doing so far. Um, so question one, you have to be an adult to apply for a patent. Uh, go ahead and type your answer into the chat box. Okay. False, false, false. Seems to be pretty unanimous. Go ahead and reveal the answer, Dr. V. False, yes. Nice. Um, so again, yeah, you, you can be anyone from any walk of life at any age. Um, so what type of intellectual property uh, protected Frank Epperson's invention, the Epsicle, or what became the Popsicle? Was it a trademark? Was it a patent, a copyright, or a trade secret? Go ahead and enter that into the chat box as well. All right, so we have mostly patents, one trademark, a couple trademark, one copyright. Um, and the answer is patent, correct? So uh, as Dr. B mentioned, it was, it was a process for creating this frozen confectionery. Um, so it was actually a utility patent. But, but it is true, um, let me add that the popsicle is a registered trademark, which is a form mm -hmm. of intellectual property. So maybe there are actually two answers if you're referring to the, to the name of the, of the product itself. So good. Right. So that's a good point. Okay, in order to be granted a utility patent, the invention has to be uh, new, useful, and not obvious, proven, the same as other inventions, or better. That's an easy one, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Priscilla, Don, Cindy, number one. Yep. Right. Red, love it. New, yeah. Well, it's got to be new, useful, and non obvious. It's got to have all three check marks. Correct. Right. Good job. Okay, you're allowed to study patents to get ideas to create new and different inventions, true or false. Okay, it looks pretty unanimous on this one as well, true. Um, right. Yeah, exactly. So we, we always encourage people to look at patents for inspiration. Um, that's, that's kind of what the driving force of innovation often is, is, is taking something that exists and making it better or changing it in some way. Um, so yeah, and that's the, the whole point of the patent system to give people ideas and inspiration. Okay. All right, Chris, let's take a closer look at, uh, at the patent. Um, every patent has a first page that looks something like the picture shown here on the right. Um, it has an abstract, which is similar to a research paper. It's a short summary of the invention. There's obviously a written description that um, describes how does it work, how is it made or used. Uh, patent examiners love to see drawings. Uh, how does, you know, what does it look like? And you'll see many drawings here. You see a drawing of what looks to be like a, uh, a laptop computer. 
And finally, the most uh, important, perhaps, uh, aspect of, of a patent is found at the very end, and it's the claims. It could be one or more um, uh, claims to a, a patent, and those really define in legal terms the boundaries of the invention, right? And it's similar to a deed or a property. I had my uh, property recently surveyed, and, you know, they gave me a little map and said, this is what you own. This is your property. So this is what you're entitled to. Okay. Dr. B, we got a question in the chat. Sure. Um, do you have to have an attorney to draw up patents. Uh, could you repeat? Do you have to have an attorney to draw patents? Yeah. Uh, well, they have to, they have to meet certain specifications. Uh, usually there are some folks that are specialized in this type of graphical drawings. Certainly for a non-provisional application, um, you have to have meet those requirements and specifications and a lot more of those details can be found on our website. For a non-provisional application, um, uh, you actually can, you know, hand drawings uh, could, could actually suffice. There are no requirements for the drawings piece there. Okay. Good question, thank you. All right, so here's a sample claim. This is a chair and it says a chair comprising means it has all these things as part of the invention. It has a seat, has a back support um, attached to that seat. And so, you know, it's a, a very specific step-by-step uh, -step description that encompasses in words through the, the use of language <clears throat> and specific words the the invention itself right so um what we want to ask you is uh <clears throat> what kind of patent could this be could it be a utility patent a design patent or a plant patent type in your answer in the chat box okay donna said design david said design so it could be a design it also could be a utility you're right it could be a utility patent too. Actually, the patent on the right is a fictitious one. It's a mock patent. If they had one claim, it would have been a design patent because they usually have just one claim. But uh, since this has two claims, it's most likely a functional utility patent. So it has some function. And you can imagine that the function is its ability to kind of swivel around. I remember having, I think we all have one of those chairs at home someplace. All right. Cool. All right, so how do we take this into the classroom? I know our teachers are saying, okay, well, this is very nice and theoretical. Well, how do we apply it? All right, so let's apply it. One of my colleagues who's on the phone here, Juan Valentin, who's, been, uh, who's in our education office um, and who was a former patent examiner for many years, uh, came up with uh, this patent claim student activity. And so we ask students to draw right, because drawing is important, right, when kids says, I have an idea, this is great, but we want to get that idea from the mind onto a piece of paper, onto a model, onto a prototype, so draw or make the invention as described by the, the, the following patent claims, so it says, I or we, because it could be more than one inventor, um, this, is, this invention actually is for a new toy, for a pet, a toy for a pet, Right? You see them at supermarkets, there's lots of toys for pets that comprises, and then you can read the specific um, components to that, uh, to that uh, particular uh, pet toy, if you will. So here's an opportunity for your students to take claim language and then bring it to life, so to speak, with the drawing or the sketch. And we would say, you know, a great activity to also do uh, during distance learning or online learning. You could have kids um, go around the house and, and get materials from around the house um, and start building it. If you wanted to make it even more challenging, you could ask your students that the invention must fit on a four by six um, uh, index card. But, you know, at the end of the day, most importantly, we've been doing this for a number of years around the nation. Let your students have fun and use their imaginations, right? You will absolutely be amazed, and I'm sure you have seen it already, 
of what your students are capable of coming up with. All right, here's another game, uh, the IP matching game. Guess that patent. All right, so we want you to take a moment. We're gonna give you 30 seconds, not a lot. Uh, take a moment and read the following claim that's actually taken from an actual United States patent. All right, 30 seconds on the clock. Chris, help me out with the time. All right, I got it. Ten seconds. Ten seconds. Ten second countdown. <clears throat> See you One. Okay, time. All right, good. I saw some things in the chat. Priscilla helicopter, the air balloon. All right, now match the claim to the actual patent drawing. Which one of these do you think it corresponds to? A, B, C, or D? I see a D, I see a C, I see C, I see D, I see B. Don has it, Don Stevens says D, Michelle is C, she likes C, Christina likes C. Any more? Mr. Craddock likes D. Ah, okay, C. So it looks like it's a, between C and D. Um, nobody picked D. It's actually D, okay? Um, but you have to read it carefully. You can see that the claim language uh, can be tricky sometimes. And it's a good opportunity for kids to, to see that um, and to be able to kind of relate, you know, how inventions are protected through the power of language and words and drawings. All right, guess that inventor. Who is the inventor on this patent? Is it James West, Thomas Edison, Ellen Ochoa or Abraham Lincoln? Please type that on your chat box. James West, Denise, James West, Ellen Ochoa, Jennifer says Jennifer, Edison, oh boy, we got oh, everybody, Abraham, everybody, okay. <laughs> Jackie says Edison and Jackie is right, Thomas Edison. Uh, great job, guys. We'll talk about the other inventors in a moment here. Okay? All right, so who can be an inventor on a patent? Um, I think we asked this question before. Um, so anyone, actually, um, who contributes to the conception um, of an invention. And conception refers to anyone who either contributes directly or indirectly to one or more claims that ends up in, in the patent. So. It could be a sole inventor, or it could be a combination of inventors. Um, I was in the private sector for many years at, at Bell Laboratories, where I invented a lot of different things. Um, I have a few patents to my name, but I got to tell you, none of them were done alone. They were always in, on a team. They were always done with uh, someone else. So it's more fun to invent with someone else um, and, and with a partner. So. Um, Great opportunity for kids to collaborate and problem solve together and brainstorm. So let me take you on a quick um, patent application journey. We're not gonna go into a lot of detail, uh, but we're gonna give you kind of a sense. I think in the beginning, there were a couple things about the patent process. This gives you kind of a, a trailer for the patent process. Obviously, we have programs that um, we spend half a day or a full day or even week long um, going through the application process and all these kinds of tools and things that, that you can use to support student learning in the classroom. But we're going to give you just a, a very quick um, trailer version of the patent application uh, process. So first thing you need is an idea, right? And then, you know, is your idea worth protecting? And, and this often takes the form of an important business decision, something that you almost have to have a little crystal ball. Um, but yes, it starts with an idea. It starts with your students coming up with these ideas through brainstorming and through their passion and through their imagination. So Chris, I think it's time for another quickie. Um, <laughs> how old do you have to be to get a patent in the United States? 
16. I know Oklahomans can drive and get a license at 16. 18 to vote, 21 to drink. If you can get a license, you, okay. So it looks like it's converging on no age requirement. Absolutely right. There actually is no age requirement. Well, Dr. V, you might say, really? Really no age requirement? Well, let me give you an example. Marissa Strang. Uh, let's take a quick peek at a young inventor. Um, Marissa Strang, who uh, we actually had the honor of meeting a couple of years ago in Florida where she lives, has both a United States patent and a registered trademark from the US Patent and Trademark Office. Let's, uh, let's see what she invented. Are you tired of your wet dog leaving smelly wet spots on your furniture? Do you want to eliminate the aggravations of your wet dog racing through the house, shaking water and everything, or worse yet, rolling outside in the dirt? Do you avoid hugging your dog until they're fully dry? Introducing the Puff and Fluff. The Puff and Fluff is revolutionizing the dog drying process. It's simple, it's easy, it's fast, and it's safe. Gone are the days of confining your pet or leaving them alone for hours to dry. That damp dog smell is now gone within minutes. From a third grade school science project called Invention Convention, and with the love for her pet pug mojo, Marissa Strang set out to find a better way to dry her dog. The goal? Dry your pets fast before they have a chance to run away and cause trouble. Here's how it works. After bathing your dog, towel dry any excess water from your pet. Locate the head and tail markings on the puff and fluff and place your dog appropriately on top of it. Reach underneath and pull your dog's paws through the leg hole openings. Then simply grab both sides of the puff and fluff, ring together, and attach the Velcro. Lightly tighten the drawstrings around your dog's neck and tail. No need to over tighten. Air should be able to flow through the openings. Attach virtually any blow dryer to the flex hose and turn your dryer on warm or low heat using the high speed setting. Dogs love the circulating warm air. The Puff and Fluff not only calms your dog, but makes your dog fluffier too. After a few minutes, loosen the drawstring on the neck or tail and reach in to feel the air. Make sure the temperature is not too hot. You can also check to see if your dog is completely dry. Now, the hours of dry time are accomplished in just minutes at an affordable price. My dog loves the warm air and I like giving him a bath now. No more wet smelly dogs with the Puff and Fluff. I rode the Puff and Fluff. For more Okay, uh, it, it's a great story. We always get a lot of smiling faces um, with, uh, with Marissa Strang and, and her invention with, uh, with, with the Puff and Fluff. Um, so question um, for this group. Um, what type of patent do you think Marissa Strang was granted by the USPTO? Utility, plant, or design? Thank you, Courtney. Yeah, it's awesome video. <laughs> utility. Good, good. All right. So under utility, they are different components of utility. You can either be a processor, a method, a machine, an article, manufacturer, a composition of matter. Which of these categories shown here do you think um, fits into Marissa Strang's invention? You can put that in your chat box. Yeah, it could be a machine or a process. Good, David. Yeah, a machine, a process. Good. All right. All right, this group is on fire. Um, Wayne um, mentioned at the beginning the story about Philo Farnsworth. I think we're going, we're going to uh, offer these slides um, uh, to all of you. Uh, but this is a great series, American Genius, uh, National Geographic, and it's a story about Philo Farnsworth that uh, Wayne mentioned um, earlier. He was a pioneering inventor. Uh, he was a high school student um, in physics, and it's just a, a riveting, riveting and compelling story about innovation, perseverance, and grit, some of the things that you said that your students, the skills that your students need for the workforce of the future. So um, in the interest of time, we're gonna, we're gonna move on to the next. Or maybe not. 
All right, so the first thing is the idea. The next thing is presenting your idea. Maintaining confidentiality is an important um, aspect of, uh, of that. You know, don't be afraid uh, to champion your idea, but it's best to maintain confidentiality prior to filing your patent application. Um, it's a best practice to consult with an attorney about, you know, safe ways to disclose your invention before you file a patent application, okay? And one thing I just wanted to add, Dr. B, if I can, um, it's important that a lot of people don't know that once you've actually publicly disclosed your idea, um, you only have one year from that date to actually file a patent application. Um, so it's something that, that people should be aware of, and students. And that's, and thank you, Chris, for, for that. And, and that applies only in the United States. Um, we uh, offer a one-year grace period, if you will. Uh, once you disclose, you actually forego uh, the opportunity to protect your invention in other parts of the world. So that only applies in the United States. So as a best practice, um, you want to make sure that you file your application uh, before you uh, talk about uh, and share with others your invention and the details. Okay. Um, the next step is uh, drafting the application. So it's now to write up the patent application. So what do you need to do? Uh, well, uh, a patent is like a quid pro quo. Uh, in exchange for these rights, you have to um, fully disclose your invention so that the public, when the patent issues, uh, can benefit from it and build on it. I mean, that's how you have technological progress. So that's the, uh, the exchange. The government says, tell us what you've invented, if it meets those three criteria, and then we let the whole world know, this is your invention, and your students can take those patents and those inventions and make them better and come up with their own subsequent inventions um, and discoveries. So that's a, the principle of that. And finally, you file the application to us. Um, as part of the application, you also need to file a sworn oath or a declaration that you are the inventor, that you invented the invention as uh, described in the application. Um, you will expect your first communication from us um, about your application for patent within approximately about 16 months. All right, so we talked about patents. I know we got about 10 minutes to go. We're now going to accelerate <laughs> in physics terms. Uh, we wanna just briefly mention some trademarks and a little bit about copyrights and just for definitional purposes and then um, spend the last few minutes with you telling you where you can go for um, resources and more help, okay? Um, so take it away, Chris. All right, thank you, Dr. V. Um, so what is a trademark? Um, any word, name, symbol, or design, or any combination thereof used to identify the source of products and services and distinguish them from other sources. Um, they are often, dis they are often uh, identified by one of three symbols, either that TM for trademark, the SM for service mark, or the R with the circle around it for, which is Uh, Chris, I think we lost you. Uh, Delbo, d d can you hear Chris? No, it looks like he There's is. McDonald's, uh, there is McDonald's, Golden Arches with the word McDonald's in it. Um, okay, so yeah, again, it can be a combination of words and designs. So you have the, the name Nike, the name Target, the name Gatorade. Um, those are all word marks. If you took just the swoosh or just the circles or just the lightning bolt, um, that would be a design mark or again, the combination where it can have the word, the name of the company and some kind of logo to go with it as well. Okay, so why are trademarks important? Um, well, here's the question. If you saw these uh, products in the store with no labeling on them to identify what they are, what would you assume that the container on the left is? Go ahead and put that into the chat. 
Okay. Super glue, toothpaste. Super glue, toothpaste. <laughs> um, exactly. So, so you might think it's toothpaste, but if it doesn't have a label on it, who knows? It could be neosporin. It could be super glue, and that would obviously be uh, terrible. And the same thing with the, the beverage on the right. You don't know whether that's soda. You don't know whether it's carbonated water. You don't know whether it's an alcoholic drink. Um, so the labeling is what helps us to identify where that product actually comes from. Um, so again, it's a source identifier, which lets you know what is the company that is actually producing this, uh, this product. Okay, so we'll talk real quick about copyrights as well. Um, so copyrights are um, things that protect original works of authorship. Um, so for example, books, plays, movies, um, art, as you might think about it, painting, sculptures, um, choreographed dances, things like that uh, would all fall under copyright. Um, so yeah, again, it's something that has to be put into a tangible, uh, into something tangible as well. So um, just like with inventions, it can't just live in your head. You actually have to put it into a fixed structure. So writing it down, uh, for example, or, or recording something. If it's you know a, a song, you wanna make sure that you write down the lyrics. You wanna make sure that you actually record the, the melody as well or write down the melody. Uh, so good. And then finally, we'll touch on trade secrets. Um, so this is something that it, it offers the least amount of protection from an official standpoint. Um, the whole basis of trade secrets is that it is dependent on you, the, uh, the secret owner, to maintain that secret. Uh, so some famous examples are Coca-Cola, Krispy Kreme donuts, um, McDonald's special sauce, the KFC, uh, what is it, 11 herbs and spices, 12 herbs and spices. Um, so those are things that the company itself has to keep secret. Um, if somebody is able to figure it out, then there's really nothing that you can do about it. Um, in terms of like getting any kind of federal protection, it's just dependent on you being able to keep that secret amongst yourselves. Okay, Chris, okay. thank um, you. So, so now I'm just going to move on to uh, just some resources, some additional things um, that we can offer or at least that, that you can take a look at. Um, this is our kids pages. Uh, so we at the, uh, the Office of Education Outreach have developed some resources, materials, um, their activities. If you go to uspto.gov slash kids, you can kind of explore a little bit. Um, and thank you, Delbo, for putting that into the chat. Um, yeah, there's a number of videos like the Marissa string. We have a few other videos with, with kid inventors um, and just some really good information about the trading card series. The, um, we have an IP patch that, that we do through Girl Scouts um, and again, the collectible cards. So uh, this is Juliet Gordon-Lowe speaking of the, the Girl Scouts IP patch. She was uh, the founder of the Girl Scouts, Juliet Gordon-Lowe, uh, but she also has patents to her name as well um, and trademarks with the um, with the logo for Girl Scouts, the trefoil. Um, and these are some examples of just other people that we feature. Tesla is, is probably one of our more popular cards. Um, and these cards are, are actually very popular. Whenever we go out, um, we hand them out to people and uh, they, yeah, they're, they're very popular. Um, this is Abraham Lincoln. He had invented a method for buoying vessels over shoals. He was an avid boater. Um, and so the problem he was trying to solve is getting boats unstuck from shoals when they actually accidentally washed ashore. Uh, and so what he essentially invented was a, a flotation device, um, kind of like the floaties that a kid would wear in the pool to lift the boat up. And he's the only U.S. Uh, president to have a, 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 a patent. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, Again, Forrest Bird, he was uh, also a pilot and he developed some um, a respirator, essentially a, a baby bird respirator for, for kids in hospitals, but also for um, pilots to help them breathe at, at altitude. Um, so again, we have activities that are based off of a number of these cards, not all of them yet, um, but we are working on trying to develop, we're always working on new activities for uh, some of the featured inventors. 
Um, and one more example is uh, Jim West, who, who did a lot of work with, um, with sound, sound waves, and he, he invented the electric microphone, um, which is used in, uh, I think it's 99%, something like that, 95% of, uh, I think we we uh, Chris we can't we can't hear you. I think your connection uh, Delbo, can you hear him? No, he didn't freeze up. It didn't look like it's just I've lost okay. his connection. So I, I I will continue, uh, Chris. I don't know if you're hearing me. We're gonna we're gonna move on. Sure. Um, so in addition to um, our kids pages that uh, Chris just des uh, des described. Um, we, uh, we have collaborated with the National Science Foundation and NBC Learn, for example, to produce two collections of what we call the Science of Innovation. They're designed to inspire um, future inventors and entrepreneurs. They come with videos of real inventors and they have lesson plans for both middle school and high school students, um, well, for teachers, but geared for middle and high school students. Um, we also run the USPTO, uh, an annual National Summer Teacher Institute, which is a, essentially a week-long boot camp for teachers who want to bring in innovation, STEM, and intellectual property together into their classrooms. Uh, you should check our website for more details about that. Um, sorry, got to advance. That's here. Um, there are a lot of um, things to support the patent process and a lot of information. We have a dedicated inventors assistance um, center um, staffed by former supervisory patent examiners. They're very experienced. They can help answer any general questions you might have about the patent process, policy and procedures. We also have a, a patent pro bono program um, that uh, assists financially under-resourced uh, independent or individual inventors or small businesses. There's some qualification uh, criteria. Um, again, check our website for more details about that. Um, the pro bono organization, um, uh, there's a network uh, of them across the nation for Oklahoma. Um, you would be working with uh, St. Louis University, who actually last fall, um, we uh, entered into a uh, partnership uh, relationship with St. Louis University in an effort to deliver the pro bono patent uh, program. And they will cover all of those states that are shown in the light green between Texas and the upper Midwest. Um, let's see, we also have the law school clinics. These are, um, this program allows law students that are enrolled in a number of law schools throughout the country to practice before the USPTO uh, under supervision of a faculty member at that school. Um, we also have our PTRCs, the Patent and Trademark Resource Center. There's one at Oklahoma State University, which is currently a partner with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, OSU. Um, the OSU PTRC provides um, assistance free of charge. Uh, you have to make an appointment. Um, with a preliminary patent and trademark research, uh, help you to do trademark and patent uh, research and assist others in uh, locating resources, other resources at the USPTO as well. We have a helpline, we have a bunch of different resources and I know we're almost out of time and Bilbo's looking at me, but thank you so much for your attention. Uh, we really appreciate, we're super delighted um, that we have been given this uh, blessed opportunity to spend this hour with you and begin our journey together. We have an important mission together to, uh, to achieve, uh, and that's uh, helping uh, our future uh, innovators and entrepreneurs. And it starts with the work that you do across the state of Oklahoma, and we wanna be partners with you in that endeavor. And on behalf of the United States Patent and Trademark Office, Chris Dolce and Wayne Stacy our Silicon Valley Regional Director, thank you so much uh, for inviting us today. And a special shout out to Nate Jarbo, who we met in um, San Antonio. Um, we were lucky enough to meet him um, in San Antonio early in February. It was our last trip that we took before the lockdown. And through his efforts, uh, 
He helped us to connect with OEIP. And so here we are. Thank you, Nate. Uh, appreciate um, what you've done to help us get this far. Dr. V, thank you so much. I have, we have one comment and, and quick question. I don't know if you, it'll be, it could uh, allow for a quick answer or not, but can, do you have time for just a second to address Ooh, that? Absolutely, absolutely. Gretchen, Gretchen made a comment. She said, in certain industries, it seems very common to study the patents of competitors and then try to find workarounds or other ways to achieve a certain functionality without impinging upon existing patents. Could you talk about that process and the first to file concept and fencing by filing multiple variations of patents to block out other companies' use. Wow, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, you have 30 seconds. You have 30 seconds. No, okay, serious. so in terms of the competitive advantage, yes, absolutely. Companies do that all the time. They're trying to define their fence. You know, what is their fence of protection? And that's why it goes back to what we earlier were talking about in terms of the, the claims. The claims builds the fence around your property, okay? And um, the bigger the fence, the wider the fence, the more protection you have, but the harder it is to get that patent approved by a patent examiner. So there's usually kind of a negotiation that takes place between the inventor and the patent examiner. Because at the end of the day, we want to issue the highest quality patent uh, possible, which means when we define that scope of protection, you know, that's the scope of protection that, that you can then basically take to court if you have to, uh, if someone infringes on your protected invention or property. And with respect to first inventor, we used to have first, to, first inventor to invent with the America uh, uh, Competes or America Invents Act AIA a few years back. It's now first inventor to file. So yes, you got to get to us as fast as you think you're ready to, to be able to disclose uh, your invention to us. And I think there was a third one, Delbo. Uh, I forgot the third one. Uh, let me get back up to that real quick. We're all right. The third one was um, blocking out other companies, filing multiple variations of patents to block out other companies' use. Yeah, I I uh, I don't know how to, I don't have any any of my colleagues at the USPTO or maybe Wayne or or Juan who are online can can answer uh, that one. But but I think it it you know at the end of the day, uh, patents uh, protect the property and the scope. And so um, you know thinking about uh, not a workaround, right? But at the end of the day, you have to. It's incumbent upon the inventor to police. We're not the police for the protection that we offer you through the US uh, patent, right, process. Once you issue a patent, it's up to the inventor um, to police uh, that, that protection. By the same token, if you're a bis small business owner, a, an, in an inventor, and you're doing something that infringes on someone else's intellectual property or patent, it's, it, the due, you have to do the due diligence, right? You, you, you are responsible for making sure that you are not infringing on that. So I think, I don't know if that answers the question, maybe in part. Um, I know we're short on time. We have our email addresses here. You can reach us or Chris um, with any other questions you might have or our general education inbox. Um, and we'd be happy to you know, continue this um, conversation afterwards or anything that we could do uh, to help educators um, and students uh, you know, please just, you know, reach out to any one of us. Okay, Dr. V and Christopher, thank you so much. And just want to let you know, we're going to continue to have OEIPs in the future and we just have an open invitation. You can, you can depend on, on us contacting you, hopefully. And we really appreciate this information. It's great stuff for kids and for adults. And, uh, and thank you. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Dubbo. Thank you, Whitney and Karen and Nate very much. Uh, and all of you educators, uh, you do great things, and I know in spite of all the challenges that our country and the world is facing, you manage to continue to inspire, to teach, and uh, thank you for all the work that you do. All right. Thank you.